are you doing? Eating. You know it's bad for your kidneys, right? Yeah, I know it's bad for my kidneys, but I love it. But speaking of kidneys, for today's episode of Human Anatomy, we're gonna talk about the urinary system. So the urinary system, or also known as the renal system, produces, stores, and eliminates urine, the fluid waste excreted by the kidneys. It also regulates blood volume and blood pressure, controls level of electrolytes and metabolites, and regulates blood pH. Now, how does plasma or blood flow through our kidneys? So first, the oxygenated blood that contains waste and other materials flow from the big abdominal aorta. Then, it enters the kidney through the renal artery. And it's going to segment into five smaller arteries called the segmental arteries. Next, it's going to go into the lobes of the kidneys. Typically, one kidney contains five to eight lobes, and each of these lobes contain arteries. So each segmental artery will split into two interlobal arteries. So you have about 10 of them. From that, it will now go to the arc of the interlobal arteries that joins blood back again together, and they call it the arcuate arteries. On the top of each lobe are tiny arteries that radiate out toward the cortex of the kidney, and we'll call it cortical radiate arteries. Now the cortical radiate arteries go to tiny arterioles called the afferent arterioles, where regulation of blood pressure occurs. From there, it goes to the glomerulus, which is the site of filtration, and where glomerular capillary beds are present. And then blood that is filtered will then continue to the efferent arterioles, where it carries filtered blood away from the glomerulus. The efferent arterioles goes to another capillary bed called the peritubular capillary bed. And then there will be a return of blood after that. It goes from the peritubular capillary bed to the cortical radiate venules, back to the cortical radiate vein, then arcuate vein, to the interlobar vein, segmental vein, renal veins, and lastly, the vena cava. Now, how does your kidney form urine? There are three stages of urine formation, filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. Urine is actually formed in the nephron, which is the functional unit of our kidney, where filtration of blood plasma also occurs. One kidney actually contains one million of these nephrons. Wow, that's a lot of nephrons. Now let's take a look at the structure and the parts of a nephron. So this is the structure of our nephron. At this part right here on the top, we have the Bowman's capsule which contains the glomerulus, the red portion. This part is the proximal convoluted tubule. And this part right here, the descending and ascending part, is your loop of Henle. And this part is the distal convoluted tubule. And lastly, the collecting duct. So the first stage would be filtration. Filtration or glomerulus ultrafiltration. The reason why it is referred to as ultrafiltration is because the blood vessels are continually narrowing into these arterioles and even narrow into thinner glomerulus which is very porous. So the blood pressure is being further increased, blood flow is high, and this facilitates ultrafiltration. So what exactly is being filtered from the blood plasma during filtration? So we have the water, salt, glucose, amino acids, urea, and vitamins. But not all of these are actually waste products, and so they need to be reabsorbed and taken back to the bloodstream. It is also important to know what is not being filtered or is too big to be filtered. These are your blood cells and your large plasma proteins. Now where does this process of filtration occur? It took place in the cortex of the kidney, specifically in the glomerulus that sits in the Bowman's capsule. And this combination is called the renal corpuscle. Now the second stage is reabsorption. Remember that not all materials are waste. They need to be reabsorbed and taken back to the bloodstream. Most reabsorption takes place in the proximal convoluted tubule. So once the laminar filtrate or the glomerular filtrate pass through the proximal convoluted tubule, we're only talking about the fine-tuning reabsorption of water and salt. All glucose gets reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule by combination of active transport and diffusion. Most of the salts are reabsorbed through active transport or diffusion as well. All of the amino acids are reabsorbed mostly by active transport. And lastly, water is reabsorbed through osmosis. As the glomerular filtrate goes to the loop of Henle, only water is reabsorbed, and it is through osmosis. As the filtrate enters the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, only salt is reabsorbed, and it is through diffusion. And as the glomerular filtrate passes up in the loop of Henle, salt is reabsorbed, but this time it is through active transport. The filtrate now enters the distal convoluted tubule, where water is reabsorbed through osmosis, and salt is reabsorbed through diffusion if needed. And if it enters the collecting duct, water can be absorbed as well through osmosis if needed. So to recap, reabsorption of the materials took place in the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct of the nephron at the cortex and the medulla of the kidney. 
Now the last stage is secretion. Substances such as ions like potassium ions, hydrogen ions are dumped into the nephron. And this all takes place at the distal convoluted tubule. This is an important process because the secretion of hydrogen ions controls the pH of the blood, which can help in homeostasis. So the kidneys are not only organ of secretion, but are also involved in homeostasis. So what eventually passes out of the collecting duct is urine, which is composed of your salt, water, and urea. There are actually three mechanisms that our body uses in maintaining the blood pH. These are your chemical buffers, pulmonary regulation, and lastly, your renal regulation. Chemical buffers. The most important chemical buffer is bicarbonate. The body uses bicarbonate to perform a chemical reaction with strong acids and bases on a regular basis. The hydrogen ion binds to the hydrogen, leaving the reaction with water and carbon dioxide, which can easily be eliminated by breathing and urination. This reaction can also be reversed if more hydrogen ions are needed to be released into the blood and make it more acidic. The kidneys actually aid in this process by releasing bicarbonate when it is needed. Pulmonary regulation. Elimination of carbon dioxide through exhalation is involved in regulating the pH of the blood. The amount of carbon dioxide exhaled in the lungs is regulated in response to changes in acidity. A decrease in pH is sensed by central or arterial chemoreceptors and leads to deeper and faster breathing. More carbon dioxide is exhaled, less hydrogen is made, blood acidity decreases, and blood pH returns to normal. Pulmonary regulation is faster. It will take place just within minutes to an hour. The final mechanism is your renal regulation. Blood pH is regulated through excretion of hydrogen ions and reabsorption of bicarbonate ions through the kidneys. The kidneys control blood pH by adjusting the amount of excreted acids and reabsorbed bicarbonate. Renal regulation is lower. It usually takes days to respond to pH disturbances. Now, what are the implications of acidosis and alkalosis? There are actually two types of acidosis, respiratory acidosis and metabolic acidosis. Respiratory acidosis may result from inadequate function of the lungs which causes arterial carbon dioxide to accumulate. On the other hand, metabolic acidosis results from excessive production of metabolic acid, decreased ability of the kidneys to excrete acid, ingestion of acid, or loss of alkali. Metabolic acidosis is characterized by primary decrease in plasma bicarbonate. There are two types of alkalosis as well, respiratory alkalosis and metabolic alkalosis. Respiratory alkalosis is caused by increased ventilation resulting in excessive exhalation of carbon dioxide. Metabolic alkalosis can result from excess loss of acids through kidneys of gastrointestinal tract, bicarbonate retention, or ingestion of alkali. Metabolic alkalosis is characterized by primary increase in plasma bicarbonate. That's it for this video guys! I hope you learned something amazing! Stay tuned for more episodes of Your Anatomy!